Oh yes, uh, Pacific Community, very familiar. Latia, could you tell us about open source software in disaster risk reduction in the Pacific region? Uh, <laughs> oh, sorry. Could you tell us about open data from an ideology to an application? Yeah. Sure. Thanks. Hi, Kirana Talafalava Mbola. Hello, everyone. Um, this journey actually began about almost 20 years ago, which is quite scary when I think about it now. Um, and it really stemmed from a single person that I worked with who was quite keen to look at how open source software could actually be used to inform, um, to inform some of the decisions that government uh, were making around, around in, you know, development and planning. Um, one of the things with the work that we were doing was that it was actually funded by the European Union, which is re which was really great because you know the European Union has been quite progressive. You know, passed legislation um, last year on, on on open data and the reuse, reuse of public data, so it's really um, set the bar quite high in terms of what is what is potentially possible. Um, what I should add as well is when we first started doing this work most countries actually didn't have access um, to any open data platforms or even any data platforms. Um, so one of the first things that we did was actually installing these map servers, and this is around 2003. And you know, the, most offices then in the Pacific hadn't had connection, internet connectivity. So when you immediately plug in a server and you connect uh, computers to it, you almost crash the system because all the computers that were offline immediately start updating virus, antivirus software. Um, and what we found though was the results of it was actually quite exciting. And I'll talk about it a little bit little more after this. So why do we bother about open data in, in, in the work that we do around uh, resilient development or even around disaster reduction? Um, this is just a snapshot of Cyclone Winston here in Fiji in 2016, one of the largest cyclones that had uh, measured to date in the Southern hemisphere. Um, Cyclone Winston devastated Fiji. Uh, you know, 44, 44 people unfortunately lost their lives. Um, about 540,000 people were affected, which is, you know, out of a population of around 800,000. Um, people had to be relocated out of places where they lived. Some um, haven't entirely moved back four years later. What was interesting though, when I was looking at this was that the combined damage and loss number for Winston, um, when you look at the economic impact, the estimate, the estimated amount was about 0 0.9 billion in US dollars, in US dollars. Now, if you, and, and the number itself is quite high when, when looked at alone. Um, what becomes even scarier though, is when you look at the donor funding to Fiji, the five years prior, and you're looking at the combined sum of $1.093 billion. So, you know, almost comparable that the money, that the, that the donor funding that had actually um, been invested in Fiji was the equivalent was actually uh, lost as a result of one cyclone event. And this is what we're trying to deal with um, in present day that, and, and how do we actually, how do we do this? How do we actually, um, reduce these economic impacts, but also how do we actually start to raise awareness around what people can do to be safe or safer? So there was a there was a, a quite an investment about ten years ago around um, trying to actually understand what what the what the Pacific what the potential Pacific risks were in relation to natural hazards. Um, this was work that was done with the World Bank um, and has actually continued you know, since, since in, in the last 10 years in, into expanding beyond what it was initially done. Um, so when you're starting to talk about what countries need to put away in terms of uh, um, financing, what does that mean? What is, it, what is the, the, the bar at which you pitch this at? So a major mapping work was actually undertaken with the countries um, that participated. There were 15 countries altogether. Um, we did field surveys in 11, in 11 countries over 11 months. And this was really to amass uh, data on as many buildings as possible, 
ma major infrastructure, and also to collect um, additional data that would actually supplement or contribute to the, the risk assessment that was actually being conducted. So looking at event catalogs that countries were actually uh, um, keeping or storing, and, and looking at what they had in terms of um, damage reports that don't tend to actually hit the public domain. Um, a lot of these documents that I'm referring to, or even these data sets, aren't actually exposed on the internet. So a lot of these reside on um, local servers or even on uh, individual machines that, um, you know, to, uh, or, or secured away in, in servers that are actually aren't open and accessible to anyone outside of the office. So what you see is just basically an array of data sets um, that was uh, combined. And one of the concerns that we had very early on with this piece of work was, it would have been, was how do we actually get this data and how do we get this information out so that it could actually be used by um, other, other, other practitioners, you know, beyond the purpose that it was actually collected for. And, at the time, we had actually started discussions with uh, um, the Global Facility for Disaster Reduction and Recovery, um, an arm of the World Bank, around this Open Data for Resilience initiative. So, you know, this is this is really at the early days of GeoNode um, when it was was it was initially rolled out. So, quite an exciting time for us to look at how could we start to share this data that we'd collected, analyzed, and, and um, produced in products from um, to, make it, to, to make it available and accessible, not just to the countries, but the partners that we work with. So in doing so, we thought that we'd done a fantastic job in 2012, launched the website, well, launched the Pacific Risk Information System. Um, we did a, a survey earlier this year just to check um, what people were doing, what, what, what our counterparts were actually facing um, in accessing some data or, and data and, and information around hazards and risk. Um, it was quite surprising that there weren't very many people, one, who were familiar with the Pacific Risk Information System, but that the that even if they were aware, there was actually um, no breadcrumb for them to follow to be able to access the data. Um, now, some of the feedback we were also receiving was for data sets that resided with agencies, um, and I'm referring here to, you know, to government agencies, as well as agencies like mine, which is a regional organization, that the approval process was somewhat unclear or, or, or very complex. Um, sometimes the, the data that was received was not of a reliable format, or well, was in the wrong format uh, in, in some instances. Um, often the data is outdated or there isn't any metadata attached to it. Um, from a user perspective, what was interesting as well was that a lot of the information was really not tailored to any, any particular user. Now, when we had initially done the collection um, under, for the Pacific Risk Information System, it was really to inform um, disaster risk financing. So the, the products that came out of that were really tailored for the Ministry of Finance. Um, so you, you hand this over to a disaster manager, they look at it, look, they look at it and they go, okay, this is all well and good that you showed me how much it means in economic um, the, the potential e economic impact that a, that a tropical cyclone could have in my country. But what does that mean for my mobilization of resources to prepare for the next cyclone season? So this, this made us think a little bit harder around how do we start to engage with the users of this information? So there were some lessons that we did pick up and learn to and, and, and learn. Um, one of it is that a lot of our asset a lot, a lot of our data inventories require um, standards. And we've had uh, in the last year um, two think tanks to look at how do we start to standardize um, asset data and I'm talking about buildings, infrastructure, um, and not just public facilities, private um, private facilities as well as well as communities. And how do we actually start to record and collect um, data around uh, for, on disasters, on damage and loss? And this is really important because of the, um, the, the 
the catalog that you build up and your and that you're able to actually go okay for future events this is what we can actually anticipate um, something that's been quite interesting for us is actually having demographics available now online. And this is through um, a division that we also have here at the Pacific Community that publishes this uh, census data for countries, or of, of countries, pardon me. Some of the, the points that were actually raised by countries is often when you have projects and activities that you run with them, um, you almost uh, turn the tap on and turn the, the tap off again. So we needed to leave something behind for them to be able to follow. So how could they actually routinely collect and update data? Um, how could we help resource it? What did we need to know about uh, the data about the data? So the, how do we start to collect and, and attribute metadata? Um, for those of you who've worked in the Pacific, metadata um, is, is, is not homogenous. So you, you, you get quite a, a big difference in um, how good or how well data is kept. And I guess this is one of the first sessions that we had was around that, you know, that not, not all data is created equal. And a, a lesson that we, that we learned early, early enough to, to help set down some provisions that would allow us to actually try and develop standard, you know, standardized um, tables, um, as well as a uh, clear term terminology around what it was that we were actually collecting. We also found that there were often similar campaigns being run by, by various different sectors that were actually quite um, close related. Um, as an example, asset inventories by the Ministry of Infrastructure. Now the Ministry of Finance also maintain asset inventories. Um, and for the work that we do in risk reduction, Again, asset inventories because we want to know and quantify. We want to know um, what buildings there are in, in, in an area, um, what the use for, use is of that, and and the what are the potential replacement costs for it. So the, the very same thing that infrastructure finance we're also looking at. So this has led to collaboration with uh, with the the Pacific Regional Infrastructure Facility and the Pacific Financial Technical Assistance Center. So we're not. What, what, what we're trying to actually prevent duplication in some of the, the decision, the, some of the collection that we're, we're actually uh, involved in. The engagement of the private sector. We, we very rarely in, in the development work that, that I do at least um, engage, unless if it's really around topics that relate to the risk insurance work or um, of late with some of the infrastructure engineering work. So I think and this is probably an area that we could build on for that we could actually build and strengthen um, moving forward. Actually understanding what what user needs are, um, being able to tailor products for that. The need for us to be able to focus as well on data analytics the, and, and being able to actually communicate that. So really from, a, from a, um, the standpoint of someone using the information rather than just from a collector or curator of data. Um, something that we've also picked up, um, which is basically that you do need an in-house developer if you're going to go down this route of uh, open source platforms or even open data platforms. So, um, this, this, this is something that is quite key for us. So what's happened is the Pacific Risk Information System has really become this open data platform that where we, where we've decided, we as an organization have decided that we are going to basically make data available on. So data that we collect or collate, um, that's then repackaged, that is then available for reuse by, by people or by, by, by our counterparts. In addition to that, uh, a focus on being able to develop and use tools that can actually help contextualize what it is that we're talking about. So really produ producing information that has a target audience. Um, and in this, in this case in point, I, I talk about decision makers, but this could be people who do infrastructure design, um, something as simple as making a, an evacuation map for a community. So actually understanding what those needs are um, help us deliver 
packages of information that actually uh, is usable. Um, and also understanding what that decision flow is per country um, takes us a long way in being able to actually embed some sustainability in how we actually um, collect, maintain uh, some, of these, some of these data sets and, and, and the work that we're actually investing in, which is how do we actually reduce the risks related to disasters? Um, the capacity development component, I mean, we can talk, uh, this could be a topic on its own, um, being able to provide the, to develop the skills to be able to continue to use the data. So not just collecting data, but also using it and being able to actually um, communicate, to be able to communicate the results to the people that you've actually identified. So just to close up, I mean, so basically the, the, the Pacific Risk Information System is, is online. Um, it, it, is, it, is, it is developed in a, uh, in, in a geonode environment. Um, We've had some successes with it. Uh, we're happy to discuss some of the some of the challenges with uh, maintaining online repositories here in the region, uh, given the added cost for hosting. Um, we uh, we appreciate that, and you know we're constantly trying to find ways in which we can actually make some of these open data sets available, but also usable for you. And thank you. Thanks, Latia. Thanks for giving us some insight into your work and where you're working. It's really good to see that these initiatives are not just started, but they're continued and they're, they're, sh they're showing value. Uh, we have a question from Ross Johnson. What tools are you considering for capturing and managing metadata or a, a data catalog? Cool. I've got Sachindra sitting in the, the Suva hub who could probably answer this. Um, I don't know if you have microphones down at the data hub, but basically there's a, an, um, an ISO standard that he's, he's the, uh, we're actually using for Juno. I'm sorry, I don't actually know it off the top of my head, but if Sachindra is able to get to someone somewhere, maybe yeah, he'll send me a message. I've got another question for you. Sure. Um, that was a shocking statistic you had there, a billion dollars damage and about a billion dollars in aid over the past five years. Uh, what, do, what do donors think about when they see that? Like, what's the reaction? And, and this, is, this is really where the support that we've had um, for, the, for the work that we're doing, you know, that this isn't just about um, fancy hazard models or fancy risk maps that are being produced that we're actually tagging the science or the, the results of the science, the scientific work to actually informing some of the investment um, so that you can actually see that we're with, you know, intentionally considering disasters or climate change impacts in the design of infrastructure, in the design of buildings, in where people settle. Um, so, you know, what, what, the stats don't show you is the actual investment um, in Fiji around um, flood management, um, looking at looking at infrastructure design across floodplains. So, it, yeah, it's it's scary. There's um, there's several different avenues that 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 governments are using in Fiji. There's the you know financial financing strategies that that provide a pot of money to set aside for response and recovery. But then there's also the investment component, which is the development money that that the one point the, the the one billion. You know, how do we actually ensure that that money isn't just going to be um, that that investment isn't just going to be compromised in the next big event or in the in the sequencing of events? Thanks, Latia. I don't see any more questions coming through, but it's really interesting work. I appreciate you uh, sharing your story with us.